Welcome to The Intersect, where DOD, academia, and industry meet. I'm Matthew Bakovic, and I'm joined by my colleague, Dennis Allen. Welcome, Dennis. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everybody. So today, we're going to explore a number of topics related to knowledge transfer, training, the development of skills and abilities in an organization. So maybe by way of introduction, Dennis, uh, I should tell our viewers that you're part of the Cyber Workforce Development Function, or team here. Uh, within the CERT division of the Software Engineering Institute. Maybe Dennis, for, for the folks watching, could you maybe just take a minute and explain to us what CWD does? Sure, absolutely. Uh, there's a big part of what we do is, is uh, identifying gap areas for the duty in the federal government when it comes to cybersecurity. And a lot of that has uh, revolved around building uh, cyber mission teams, uh, cyber uh, protection teams and those types of things for the military throughout Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, et cetera, and to really get them proficient at doing their job. So it's easy to build knowledge, if you will, with your true, false, multiple choice type of test or getting your certifications. In some cases, you can build your, your skill set with some hands-on labs, that type of thing. But to really be effective at your mission, it really takes experience. So how can we maximize that? How can we get these cyber protection teams and mission teams experience rapidly and get them exposed to real world threats in a safe environment where they can develop those skill sets and that expertise to be proficient when an actual event occurs. So we do that with a number of technologies that we have to uh, make delivering that easy, make it available over the internet. We do that by adding a lot of fidelity to the in-game exercises so we can replicate uh, real world uh, weapon systems or critical infrastructure or whatever their prioritized defensible assets might be. And how do they see the threats when they come in? How, do, how would they look in that kind of environment? How would they detect those and then respond to those in a environment that's modeled after their network, instrumented with their tool sets uh, to, to be able to uh, do that sort of uh, activity? Th thank you. I think that really helps to explain what cyber workforce development means in our context. But Dennis, one of the things that I hear often is that there's, there's a profound gap in the number of people, right? a lack of, of qualified, skilled individuals to do cybersecurity. And I've seen in some estimates, I believe ISC squared um, puts that number to 400,000 people. Yeah, that 400,000 is about the, we'll call it job openings that are cybersecurity related within the United States. But they do a workforce study every year, uh, which is uh, referenced pretty much by everybody. Uh, and um, I think they have previously you know, uh, partnered with Frost and Sullivan and some other groups to do that. But globally, that, that number is closer to one to four million, depending on which year you, or in which survey you're looking at. And the big thing is there are Cybersecurity is so many things, you know, it's digital forensics, it's, it's risk management, it's incident response, there's, there's so many elements to it. And we're not really reaching kids at that early level, you know, people know, hey, I want to be a star athlete, or I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, and there's these great careers, Well, you can have a great career in cybersecurity, you can have a great starting salary with a great high end, and there's all kinds of things that you can do from just, you know, being a um, uh, somebody that's monitoring things on a security operations center uh, watch floor, or you can end up being a chief information security officer or chief information officer. And there's, so there's a big range there with very uh, good careers that contribute to the community, but kids just don't know about that. So the, you're starting to see cyber awareness training at younger levels. What is cyber bullying and uh, the risks of having your information out there? But it's very difficult to get that cyber lexicon into the curriculum. So understanding what forensics is, incident response, and and uh, you know what's memory analysis, and all these fun stuff, all these fun things, right? It, it, I wouldn't say it's too advanced. Certainly you're, you're seeing some of that with Cyber Patriot and a number of other programs that are targeted at high school students to um, uh, get them that experience and get them interested. But most uh, most counselors, most educators, they, they really aren't aware of these opportunities. And that's really where the shortage is coming from. There's a big need uh, for these careers and the supply is relatively low in, uh, in terms of people coming out. They're either afraid of those careers, or they just don't know uh, about them. So there's a big push from uh, Homeland Security along with a number of other organizations to help close that gap because the more qualified professionals we have, 
the more that are available to the Department of Defense, the federal government, and industry. Thanks. So it, it sounds like what we're describing, and I, I've heard this term applied to it, there's a pipeline problem, which is if, if you don't start cultivating the people with those skills, uh, maybe even in primary school, but certainly uh, by the time they get to say, they get to high school and then on to, to university or, or trade school, that then it's very difficult to make up that gap. And I know that this this absence uh, of, of skilled resources uh, is likely to be one of those limiting factors for the foreseeable future, that all the re more reason why this is such a vital subject, both for the Department of Defense, federal civilian agencies, and also industry, right? There is a war on for talent, right? So I was hoping to ask you a question about, sorry, please. Uh, it looks no, like I mean, the war on talent is funny. You see it in a few games, or excuse me, a few movies, uh, um, I, I forget, there was one called Antitrust, which is, uh, again, I'm a big buff of uh, computer movies and whatnot, but a a Antitrust was one back in, uh, I think, the early 90s, where, um, you know, a, a Microsoft light company came in and offered, you know, a car, a house and all these perks of working what you see with like the Google shop with all the toys and uh, the FBI uh, gentleman offered him, he says, I can offer you, uh, I think he said, I think 42K in a Buick. Right. So it was, uh, you know, there, there is, uh, it's tougher to get people into the government uh, unless yeah. you have sort of uh, that ethos, that self-service that you want to have. There are scholarship for service opportunities where that's a really big one where you get, uh, if you get two year scholarship undergrad or grad, then you would have, you know, two years of um, work that you would do in the federal government. So that's a way to get people interested in that. And the DOD has great careers in cyber now to help build that skill set. Uh, which is which is outstanding, uh, and then you have those skills that you can transfer. But you know, I was uh, I was a job hopper for the first fifteen years of my career, going back and forth between uh, big companies here in the Rochester, New York area, as well as some smaller ones, and uh, eventually landed at the Software Engineering Institute, where I've now been over fifteen years, just because we have a lot of diversity in what we do, and and uh, a lot of diversity in our customers and the types of services yeah. we can offer, and a, and a lot of growth opportunity. So Dennis, I, I was going to ask you about uh, specific opportunities at the Software Engineering Institute and the CERT division in particular, but I think you said something really important in that description of, of the movie Antitrust, right? Which unfortunately I've not seen, but it, I like the vignette you offered there where it's always a trade-off, right? You have to have the right set of motivations to work anywhere. And one of the things that I really enjoy about working for a federally funded research and development center is that our mission is squarely focused on national defense and resilience of, 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 our, of our society. So uh, I know we'll, in the conversation, describe positions that, that might be available. I know, for instance, you're recruiting right now for an associate engineer position, and I'd like you to maybe elaborate on, on sort of what those responsibilities might look like for that role. But um, I think much like yourself, right, I, I, um, I'm part of the Software Engineering, engineering Institute because I see it as a way to do something that is uh, of, of benefit to the nation and certainly beneficial to personal level. So, um, you know, the description of the FBI, yeah, you get a Buick and $42,000 a year, plus, right, the very real opportunity to help, in the case of the FBI, right, engage in law enforcement to make the country a safer, better place. Similarly, right, I think our mission is very compelling. So um, I know you have, uh, you have a background uh, in the armed forces. I was just wondering if maybe you can speak to the transition that folks see before we start discussing this specific position, going from their, maybe their uniform service to working for an FFRDC. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great lead in. Uh, I, I had 14 years in the Army Reserve and a big number of folks on our cyber workforce development team are ex-military, Air Force, Marine Corps, et cetera. And um, it's an opportunity when working for a federally funded research development center to still be part of that community. And that's what makes it you know, so appealing to myself is I, I get to have sort of that impact on our military and our government while I'm still not in uniform service. So I really like that. And that's one of the big advantages or one of the things that we look for uh, when hiring somebody is do they have that military experience? Because we are a Department of Defense federally funded research and development center, we do a lot of work with the DOD. So if you have a background either working with the military or being in the military, you understand that lexicon, you understand the hierarchy, you understand some of those challenges. It's not a requirement. Certainly you want, uh, there's lots of other skills that you could have or that are valuable, but that is one in particular that, that comes into play 
uh, in our organization and one that I find valuable having that experience as well as the other folks on our team. So again, it's just that, um, that commitment to still serve the nation in some way, even though you are kind of outside of the, the uniform service. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we can offer at the SCI that, that is different, which is you will get access uh, to programs and people and topics and technologies that not everyone does, right? You're, you're doing something very important in a specialized way, right? So I think that's an important, an important part of the value proposition of working at the SEI. So Dennis, I, I do have a question for you based on, uh, on something that an audience member asked. And then I do wanna get back to describing the role that you have open. But when we think about this pipeline and we think about the, the disconnect, if you will, that's happening where maybe students don't know about careers in cybersecurity, or they're leaving high school or even college, right? With, with the wrong mix of skills or maybe unaddressed cybersecurity skills. Why don't we see, and maybe this is a loaded question, it, it seems as if we don't see a concerted effort to change the curriculums being taught in high schools and universities in cybersecurity. Now I teach at the Heinz College uh, at Carnegie Mellon and where I teach information security and compliance. I like to think that we're, we're, we are focused on the right things. But, but generally, Dennis, any thoughts about how we can improve or any efforts you'd highlight in, the, in addressing these via uh, revising the curriculum through that entire educational spectrum? Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges is we're not dealing with things at a federal or national level. Now, I'm not saying we should, but each state has their own rules for how they manage education and they have the requirements for, for math, science, technology, et cetera, right? So they have their own requirements. So fitting a cybersecurity type of requirement into this already full curriculum is a bit of a challenge. So you see opportunities now to uh, do trade schools or uh, just like you see, would see cooking uh, uh, or culinary arts or uh, mechanics types of programs uh, that, that you have. You're starting to see some interest in having a cyber security uh, cyber security type of uh, a, a program like that uh, so that's one way to do it but again the biggest challenge is that the curriculum is pretty full now and then again just teachers and educators and counselors etc really aren't aware of those opportunities so getting an awareness campaign out there or started to to reach out to these students is one way Another way is by having these programs, these things like, uh, like Cyber Patriot or Scholarship for Service, the more that those are promoted, the more that more people know about them, they can see the value in cybersecurity careers in these programs, and then in turn say, all right, let's get a program in place to help our students be better in the Cyber Patriot competition or prepare them for the Scholarship for Service type of opportunity, right? So the more colleges offer these programs and offer scholarships for them, then high schools will in turn start to develop programs so that their kids can you know, follow that pipeline. And we're, we're getting there, we're not completely there yet, um, but, but we are indeed getting there. Thanks, so you mentioned competitions, right? And I know one of the things that, that CDBD does is construct uh, ways to evaluate one's skills and abilities through, through contest and simulation, so modeling and simulation, but also, um, let's talk about the sort of structuring a, a competitive environment in which to demonstrate skills, right? So I'm thinking of um, a, a very piece of prominent work in CBD right now, which is the President's Cup, uh, which is being sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. Could you please maybe explain to the audience what that is and its significance to the program? Sure. Well, back uh, in May of last year, 2019, uh, the president signed an executive order that would be uh, uh, Executive Order 13870. And among them, among the requirements in there was to identify, recognize, and reward the best cybersecurity talent in the federal uh, executive workforce. So a competition was started, the President's Cup Cybersecurity Competition. It needed to be conducted within just a short time frame. So it was signed in May. The competition actually, the instructions were there that it was completed in calendar year 2019. So the Software Engineering Institute, along with DHS and our, our agreements that we have in place with DHS was, way, was able to uh, scramble quickly to put forth the inaugural competition. Uh, and really what that does is it assesses that to talent. We, we, it, 
took advantage of some of the typical capture the flag types of things that you would see out there. But instead of being all offensive and, and reverse engineering and exploitation, we really tried to map that to uh, the national, uh, uh, let's see, the, the nice uh, cybersecurity workforce framework. That would be um, essentially the standard for defining categories and work roles throughout not just the United States, but it's getting adoption throughout the world. So we mapped all of those challenges to those categories, and they weren't just offensive categories, they were defensive uh, categories as well as how do you uh, configure your routers and your firewalls to prevent an attack from happening, for example. Uh, we've uh, gone uh, a bit further this year in the 2020 competition and focused more on work roles versus the high level categories, which has been pretty neat. But the idea, again, coming back to uh, what you were uh, started with, Matt, is the assessment piece of this. We really want to go into, you know, can somebody walk the walk? You know, again, you can do the knowledge and a knowledge test, the true, false, multiple choice type of thing. But can you actually perform a certain activity? Uh, one that I use all the time is, is, is related to subnetting and getting a computer working on the network. You can ask somebody about, you know, what is a class C network or slash 24 site or that type of thing. Or you can say, hey, guess what? You need to get this computer talking to that router and, and see if they can do it. And then they need to analyze the other configurations to get that working. And then if they do that successfully, I mean, that's really what you're trying to find out is can they configure that device to communicate on the network appropriately? So that's kind of what we build into, not just the President's Cup and other competition types of things, but our performance-based assessment things that we integrate throughout all of our, our work for workforce development is, can you define what it means to do your mission, right? Not just the knowledge and skills, but the actual competencies. What are the tasks you need to perform your mission effectively? Translate them to actually doing something technical, because it's different to say, hey, they need to you know, uh, make sure a computer talks on the network to actually, all right, I need to define a Windows machine that has a network interface that has this IP address with this block and needs to communicate with another one. All right, now how do I build that? And then how do I test to see if they've done it correctly, right? So defining that test that maps to the task conditions, or excuse me, the, uh, the knowledge, skills, and abilities and the tasks defined for that role, taking that, finding a, a actual thing to do, and then assessing that in a technical environment, that's a bit of a challenge. And to do that at scale is really hard. And that's, that's a big part of what we do. So it, it's this, um, it, it's a demonstration of sort of the practical applications of knowledge. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. And, and I know that the, 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 the contest, um, it has been going on for, for quite some time now. And I believe we're approaching the end of this cycle of President's Cup. Is that right? Yes. The there's three three rounds. The first round is uh, is already complete, and we separate them to a teams uh, competition. And then this year we had two separate uh, tracks for the individuals, and you can compete in one or both tracks as individuals and the team. So in theory, an individual could have been in three different competitions, right? So round one is complete. Uh, we had a, a, a criteria for advancing to the second round. Uh, second rounds of teams is complete. And then we have the second round of individuals starting uh, next week. And then what will happen is uh, up, I top 10 individuals and in, uh, I'm not sure about the teams. Well, the, the criteria needs to be finalized based off of the results and the scores. And but generally, you know, last year was the top ten individuals in the top five teams. So it'll probably be something close to that this year. We'll advance to the finals round, and the finals round last year was held in person down in uh, DHS's offices in Arlington, Virginia. We did uh, the individuals day one. Day two was the uh, teams uh, day one. They had actually two multiple days, uh, and then um, their second day was uh, an, an innovation that we put together, a video game based uh, competition. So kind of your first person shooter, if you will, but you're in an environment. We actually created an escape room environment where you had to uh, solve a technical challenge, actually hands on keyboard, same type of thing you would do in the typical CTF thing, digital forensics or whatever it would be, solve that challenge to get a key or code that would unlock a door and advance you to the next to the next room. We're doing a little bit differently this year. I, won't, I don't want to give away too many secrets, okay. but the, the, the best part about that video game part of it is that uh, this year we're creating a new application and in 2021 
that application will be open sourced and available to the public so that they can leverage that with their own challenges and some of that own architecture. So that's really what we're trying to do is make, not just create these things, but make them available to the public to increase that awareness and give them the opportunity to build those skills. So last year we, we developed over 72 challenges, uh, give or take, over 70 challenges for the 2019 President's Cup Cybersecurity Competition. We have a bunch of those that are open sourced and available on CISA.gov's uh, GitHub site where you can download those and, and get some practice there. We have a playlist on the SCI YouTube channel that has uh, a number of the solves or solution videos, if you will, from those challenges. And for federal government and DOD right now, um, eventually they do wanna make it available uh, to a broader audience, but for DOD and federal government right now, there is a practice platform. So the same platform that is being used for the actual challenges that platform is hosting last year's challenges so you can get in there and practice those and, and build your skills and experience with those uh with those that we did last year and that's the same thing we'll do in 2020 anything that we're developing this year we'll make to the uh, make available to the community next year and again that helps broaden that outreach and, and help build that skill set in just a, another way yeah thanks um, so I, 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 i'm sorry. sorry matt the one thing i did want to mention about competitions is they're not for everybody right okay. so so that that's the big thing right is that you know you, you hear about cyber patriot and some of these other things and sometimes people hear uh, defcon has their big capture the flag and black hat and all these other ones are starting to have um you know hack in the box is another one they're not for everybody and sometimes uh people get intimidated by that competition factor like they get in there they're not successful and they automatically think they wouldn't be good in cyber security or this career is not right for them because they didn't excel in this competition and that is completely False. That is the wrong way to approach it. There's, you know, millions of people doing this job that have never even participated in a competition or been successful in one, but they're very successful in their career. So I just want to put that point out there. The competitions are great. And in some cases, they highlight your best and brightest in specific, in our case, technical areas, but they're not for everybody and they're not a panacea. They're not the one stop, you know, thing for everybody. No, thanks. I think it's a great, a great point of clarification, Dennis, right, which is, it's just one of the many methods by which uh, you can both learn and then express or, or confirm your skills. So a question for you, you mentioned, uh, the, you mentioned video game in, in your description. And right now, uh, with the remote work posture and the remote school posture we have, more now than ever, many young people are sitting in front of screens and they're acting as IT support and, and learning about networks, but they're also playing games, right? And gamification is one of those things where, um, frankly, uh, I may be irrelevant to that because I'm not a gamer, right? Uh, but can you explain sort of gamification, how it fits in the overall uh, strategy for training folks? Yeah, there's two, there's two ways to think about this. Uh, gamification, meaning the application of badging and scores and leaderboards and all these things can can make things uh can make uh, cybersecurity or any kind of training uh more engaging you know, it, that might be your incentive to get another badge uh or to be on the top of the leaderboard that type of thing so gamification is just a way to try to make uh the experience more game-like and make it more fun and engaging the difference would be a game based training environment where you're actually immersed in a video game and you're almost learning by accident. You're navigating this uh, environment and you're solving cybersecurity challenges to advance to the next level inside of the game. So all of the scores and gamification elements are sort of on the periphery, not really the core piece of it. But ultimately, the idea is to make it fun games and gamification make the experience more fun, more memorable, and hopefully the lessons stick a little bit better and, and increase your motivation to go through the event. Well, thanks, Seth. I appreciate it. So we're, we're closing in on the, the top of the hour, and we've mentioned that you're, you're recruiting currently for uh, an associate engineer. So I would encourage uh, those in the audience that are interested to look at at the website, at the SCI's website, and you'll see a posting there. But, but Dennis, in the in the time you have left, I was wondering if maybe you could just give us uh, just a, a snapshot of the sort of folks you're looking for as applicants for the role that you're uh, that you're actively trying to fill. Well, this is one of our more junior positions, and really one of the big differences between maybe our junior and more senior uh, folks is just the um, 
the breakdown of the work. You might be doing uh, more leadership and mentorship at a higher level than you would be doing coming in, but you might also, when you're coming in, be responsible for working with others or coordinating other interns or, or that type of thing. So you, the, the, your responsibilities are mostly the same. It's just the percentage of those change. So just keep that in mind. And, um, you know, we're really looking for diverse folks. Those, those folks, if you've got something that you can jump in and help out with right away, that's important. That's why the military experience is mentioned in there. It's very helpful. Um, we hire interns uh, because we have that experience with them. They understand our technologies and, you know, our, our battle with them, if you will. And we can assess their attitude and aptitude. And I've made hiring choices based solely on that. Like, is this a good person? Do they have the aptitude to learn? Um, are they are they good to work with others? You know, they're not a knucklehead, that type of thing. So I've made decisions based off of just the ability to to you know soak up that knowledge and be productive and be motivated, be creative and think outside of the box. And 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 that's the type of person we're looking for. But you also have to have something that you bring to the table. So what can you help out with right away? Is it that IT or infrastructure experience? Do you have that baseline knowledge with uh, your certifications? I mean, those are helpful um, just because we're talking that language all the time. So understanding the, the lexicon and, the, and the, um, the, the terms, the concepts that we use all the time certainly helps. Uh, we do a lot with instructional design, you know, understanding what an organization has currently in terms of their capability. You know, what, what do these people do? What do they have to prepare them for that job? What are they missing to prepare them for that job? How do we create that thing to help them be better or more proficient at their job? And then how do we make that thing better? And it's just a cyclical process of assessing what their needs are, developing new solutions to meet those needs and ensuring they have that proficiency. So understanding instructional design and that sort of pedagogy helps. How do people learn and how do they learn better? That's great. Um, we have a number of people that have experiences, ham radio operators or home automation or home brewing or whatever it is. Those people that like to tinker and figure things out are great people to have uh, in cybersecurity and our type of positions. Uh, so I think that's that's really it. Like again, a, a problem solver, self-motivated, a little bit of experience that you can jump in and help out with something right away, but you don't have to know everything at this particular position, right? We're just looking to get somebody that has the, the right aptitude and attitude to come in and be productive and be part of the team and, and thirsty, right? You wanna get thirsty for knowledge, you want to grow, you want to get better, you want to kind of elevate your game, we can help you do that. And then obviously, you're more valuable to yourself and to the community and to our organization. So Dennis, it, it, if I can, if I can just uh, summarize uh, uh, what you've said, right? Uh, and maybe reinforce a few points, right, which is you don't have to have a PhD in computer science to apply for a job working in CWD, right? But you do need to be able to engage in critical thinking, be a self starter, uh, and bring some practical knowledge to the job. Is that is that a fair synopsis? Yes. Okay. Well, great. So, unfortunately, Dennis, we're we're out of time. I really appreciated uh, the discussion this afternoon, and I encourage everyone to uh, to check out our website and and look at the postings you have in your area and more broadly the roles we have available at the SCI. So, thanks again, Dennis. I, I feel like I've learned a little more about uh, about the way we evaluate people's skills, and and certainly I think we reinforce the need. Uh, to address this critical gap in our cybersecurity capabilities as a nation. So thanks again. Thank you.